Okay, hello, welcome. I'm Stuart Glastonbury, um, and we're here um, today with the QRME Rural and Remote General Practice uh, Grand Round Series. Um, tonight, um, we are looking at paediatric presentations um, in general practice, and particularly uh, uh, childhood obesity. I'll kick off now by introducing Dr. Lucy Ingram. Uh, Lucy is a GP registrar with QRME, and uh, she's working at Gatton, Gatton Medical Practice. Um, with the expert panel tonight, we have Dr. Chamathi Nanayakara. Uh, Chamathi is a paediatrician at Toowoomba Base Hospital and St. Vincent's Hospital. Next to her, we've got Roshan Rafferty. Uh, Roshan is a, um, a dietitian, at, um, a paediatric dietitian at Toowoomba Base Hospital. Next to her, we've got Dr. Roz Dunlop. Roz is a GP here in Toowoomba. And, um, and she works at Shildag Medical Practice. Um, and next to her, we have Dr. Sandra Baker. Sandra is a, a psychologist here in Toowoomba. So if you could put your hands together and welcome our panel tonight. <laughs> okay, and we'll kick off with the presentation um, for, for Lucy. Why do we worry about childhood obesity? Well, it appears to be a growing problem um, in this country particularly, but also around the world. Um, and these are um, some figures from a, I think it was a 2007, um, sorry, 2009 um, study in Australia looking at um, the uh, um, uh, prevalence of childhood obesity um, over time. And as you can see, um, over that time from the 1980s um, to 2007, it's been steadily increasing. And now it's estimated that 25% um, of children are either overweight or obese, um, which is a quarter of children. So that's a massive problem. Um, so obesity in itself is an issue because um, in, in adults, we know that 7.5% of the total disease burden, um, so that's chronic disease and, and what we call morbidity or being unwell, um, is attributable directly to being overweight or obese. Um, and that's the third highest um, single cause of disease burden um, behind smoking and high blood pressure. Um, so that's a, that's a major issue. And it also has as a consequence um, in obesity um, of diabetes, uh, which with itself has its own health problems, uh, cardiovascular disease and hypertension, which can lead on again to further disease. Um, osteoarthritis is a big problem, so a lot of pain, chronic pain from obesity. And um, it's also associated with some cancers, particularly gynaecological cancers. Um, so it is an issue. And um, also um, looking at some studies for management, this is from um, an RACGP article um, which suggested that with every patient who is obese, um, we should um, put into effect the following sort of strategy to, to manage that. And that is of course to ask about it and to assess the patient. So usually obesity is fairly obvious because you can see, but actually if you don't measure the patient, then you won't know exactly how obese um, or overweight the patient may be. Um, and then once you've assessed that the patient is obese or, or overweight, um, you can then provide advice um, and um, assist them to then change that and to have some lifestyle changes that will lead to um, combating obesity and can help them by arranging for those um, things to occur um, and perhaps to arrange for a multidisciplinary team to be involved in that management. And so that's a nice mnemonic that we can remember, ask, assess, advise, assist, arrange. And that really, it, it's a, a um, mnemonic that's used for a lot of lifestyle problems and um, 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 looking at behavioural change. Um, so now some of the ways in which we can help patients to um, lose weight um, is things like portion control was shown to be very effective. Um, there has been used low fat and um, low carbohydrate diets for quite some time. However, I do think there have been some recent studies suggesting that they may not be the best way of doing it um, because of some cardiovascular risks. Um, meal replacements is another method some people use. Um, obviously exercise plays a very important role um, and then um, looking at appetite suppression through medication and even weight loss surgery. Now all of these strategies were outlined for adults and when searching the literature for 
recommendations to deal with children. There wasn't a lot <laughs> out there to actually say what we should do in, in terms of um, childhood obesity. And of course, some of these we should take with caution in, in childhood obesity. Certainly surgery has never been recommended for childhood obesity and I'm not aware of it being implemented, but you know, with this growing problem, will it be? Um, but appetite suppression, there was an article that suggested that it could be potentially used in adolescents, um, but it was, you know, with caution, with extreme caution. So um, that's what I could find about the RACGP um, article about managing obesity. In childhood obesity, what the RACGP did say in their Red Book um, was um, to opportunistically assess children whenever you see them, basically. <laughs> so um, at every age um, and at every stage, you can assess them for obesity. Um, but they certainly recommend it with your health checks, um, which are usually done at the time of immunisation, so two, four and six months and four years and so on. And what they tick in their little red book profile is to check their nutrition and to ask them about nutrition and diet, um, to um, check their height and weight, which we usually do. And they actually recommend plotting their BMI on an age-adjusted chart which is quite important in children um, because the BMI actually changes in what is normal and what is not normal <coughs> given their age and developmental stage. Um, so that's an important point about BMI in children. Um, and they also recommend assessing them for physical activity and if there's any limitations on their physical activity or if they're getting enough. Um, so what does Cochrane say? <laughs> um, there were a couple of Cochrane reviews with relationship to childhood obesity. And the first I'll talk about is prevention. So this I've directly quoted, um, but they do recommend many sort of um, interventions at school to try and prevent childhood obesity. But they also recommend support for parents to um, help them to enact those changes, pardon me, in the home. Um, because, um, you know, obviously if you do everything in school and then they go home to environments that are pro-obesity, then they're going to still end up with obesity. Um, but school is a nice captive uh, audience to, um, to get um, uh, some things implemented and that was the main reason I think most of those recommendations focus on school. Um, but also, you know, they're very much about um, physical activity, healthy eating um, and then addressing also the culture of food and the culture of obesity and, and looking at body image as well. And then there was also a Cochrane review about treatment, um, which um, basically recommended lifestyle modification, um, which, you know, if, if they actually change what they're eating and what they're doing, that's more effective than um, them just trying to sort of help themselves. Um, so there was some benefit to lifestyle modification under the guidance of a medical officer. Um, they did suggest considering medications um, for appetite suppression in adolescents, but yeah, there, there was a big but to that um, with regard to adverse effects um, and with regard to concerns about um, um, their use in, in teenagers not having been studied by drug trials as well. And there was actually very little in the way of long-term data to see whether any of these treatments had any long-term or lasting benefit. And so that is just unknown. So now to my case. Um, working in Gatton, I see quite a lot of obese children. Um, but this one stood out to me and I thought I'd share this case with you tonight. Um, so Katie is a 10-year-old girl and it was quite a memorable consult because before well, I called her into my room and then her mother came in before her and said, oh, look, she's here about her ankle, but I'd actually like to talk to you about how overweight she is. Um, I'm really worried about it. And she said to me, I think it might be her thyroid. Can, you, can we check for that? But can you not mention to Katie that we're doing that. Can we just say it's a health check because she's a bit sensitive about it and, um, and I just don't want to upset her. So <laughs> then we called in KD and I thought, oh yeah, <laughs> how are we going to do this one? So um, yeah, this was, this was an interesting case. Um, I thought that was cute and relevant. Um, Yes, so it can be really hard to bring up 
obesity and particularly if in the patient's eyes or in the parent's eyes even it's not an issue that can be very difficult to sort of mention that they're actually fat. Um, so she had been playing soccer two days ago and she'd actually rolled her ankle and it sounded from what she described like an inversion type injury. And she had iced it immediately at the game but not since then. And she'd walked off the field but since then she hasn't really wanted to wait bare on her ankle and she'd been using some crutches to get around, even at school. Um, but she had sort of been saying that she'd still been getting around about and she hadn't been putting her foot up, which had been recommended to her. With regard to her weight, mum says she's always been a big girl and mum, interestingly, was stick thin. Um, and mum says they have a very healthy diet. She says, oh, she doesn't have sweets or fatty foods. We, we eat good meats, we eat vegetables, salads. We don't do soft drinks or much juice, you know. You know we're really good with our diet, <laughs> okay? Um, but, and she said, Katie's a very active girl. She plays soccer, she plays this and that, you know, she does her sport. She loves it. You can't stop this girl. She's running around all the time. Um, so, she, you know, mum's like, why is my daughter fat? Um, her past medical history was pretty unremarkable. She'd been in for a few coughs and colds in the past, um, but no long-term chronic illnesses. And she wasn't a frequent flyer. We didn't see this girl very much at all. Um, the family history, there was that maternal aunt um, who had had childhood obesity, which was secondary to hypothyroidism. Um, but apart from that, there was nothing obesity related and no diabetes, no celiac disease or anything um, that was particularly interesting from an endocrine sort of perspective. Um, and, and really not much at all. And, and her mum and dad were quite well um, and the grandparents were well. Her development had been reasonably normal. Um, there was no concern about her milestones. Um, she'd been attending school and she was doing well enough at school. She was um, passing her grades, not an Einstein, but, but doing well. Um, and, um, and there was no issue there. And with regard to her um, sexual development, she uh, did have um, some breast development, but she hadn't yet started her periods. So her medication, she wasn't taking anything regularly. Uh, she had no known allergies, immunisations were up to date, she denied any kind of special substances um, and they were uh, fairly standard for the area, um, low to middle income family. Um, so both parents were working, um, it's an agricultural area, they were in those kind of industries. So to examine her. Um, She's 10 years old and she was 147.5 centimetres, which is tall. Her height was on the 95th centile, or 97th, pardon me, it was 97th centile. Um, and her weight was 66 kilos, which was well above the 99th centile. I regret I didn't have a BMI standardised chart to plot her on, um, so I can't tell you what a BMI was or where, where it lives on that. And um, also, in writing this up, I realised I didn't actually take her blood pressure or pulse, which I regret. Um, however, what I did see was that she had a generally sort of apple shape um, to her type of build. Um, there was no goiter and her thyroid was not really palpable. Um, heart sounds were normal, her chest was clear and her hair and skin looked normal. So she didn't look clinically hypothyroid, but you know. And I did actually look at her ankle. Um, so <laughs> there was no deformity or swelling. Um, there was some mild tenderness over sort of the upper part of her foot, her midfoot, and under the arch on palpation. Um, and she really didn't want to move it much. Um, she did move it a little bit, but she said, oh, I can't make it move. It's like there's an invisible hand holding it back and I can't move it. And I asked her if it was pain and she didn't think it was pain. I said, all right, well, look, you know, she's not weight bearing on this ankle. I guess we should get some x-rays for that. Yeah, so that's what I was thinking. I was thinking, oh, it's probably just a strain, but maybe she's done something to the tendon. Maybe there's a bit of a subacute fracture, but it didn't really sound like it from her history and her examination didn't really support that. But, you know, for what it's worth, we'll get an ankle x-ray. Um, and obviously the mother had brought up hypothyroidism and I looked in her notes and this child has never actually had blood tests in, from our clinic. 
So I thought, well, all right, let's get some blood tests. Um, so I said, you know, for your general health and well-being, which is how I'd kind of phrased it when I was looking her over after moving up from the ankle, um, let's just check your general health and well-being. Um, so I ordered a full blood count, ELFTs and thyroid function tests. In the meantime, I said, look, all right, we don't really know what's wrong with your foot until we get you back, right, so okay. let's just use some crutches well as well. That's we'll keep I going with that. Um, we'll try and put the foot up, though, a bit more, um, some elevation. She can use some ice when it gets sore, and we'll try a little bit of um, pain relief and see how she goes. And stay off, stay off it as much as you can. Don't go to sport. Um, but we'll see you back here, and we'll find out what's going on with that x-ray. So I saw her three days later. This is the difference with um, general practice and hospital. I'm used to seeing them back a bit sooner than that, but I saw her a few days later and the x-ray was absolutely normal. Um, her range of motion had improved quite remarkably um, and she was able to wait beer without the crutches quite happily. Um, her full blood count was entirely normal. Her thyroid function test was also normal, it was euthyroid. And there was a few minor abnormalities in her electrolytes and liver function tests. Pardon me. The bicarb surprised me, and I wasn't sure why it was that low, um, but she looked pretty well. Um, and her liver function tests, they were a little bit off, but I wasn't overly concerned. But that's, that's how her bloods looked. So... She had a normal ankle and she was obese. <laughs> so um, we talked about healthy lifestyle and I was still patching it as this is just for your general health and well-being. Um, and um, I thought we should try and get her back and see her again in a month to see if she's managed to put some of these changes in place. Um, and what I'd recommend it um, was five serves of vegetables and two serves of fruit every day. And I explained a serving being the size of her clenched fist. Um, to focus on with fluids to have plenty of water and just some milk and just avoid those soft drinks and fruit juice. Um, to try and reduce her starchy type of carbohydrates and focus on low GI kind of foods rather than the high GI type of carbohydrates. Um, and I showed her like a picture and we gave her a picture to take home about a colourful plate and portion sizes. And, um, and we also talked about which oils are sort of beneficial to us and which oils can be sort of harmful. Um, and I told her to get rid of the crutches. So that's a similar picture, not the same one, but a similar picture that I gave, so portions and how much in proportion on a plate. So follow up, I didn't see her again for a while. Um, she was seen by another doctor three weeks later about ongoing heel pain. And um, he felt that there was some inflammation still going on down there. So he re-x-rayed the heel, but it was fine as well. Um, and unfortunately didn't get a weigh-in at that stage. Um, but he obviously did discuss diet uh, because on the bottom of the <laughs> discussion notes was calories are in fruit juice. So maybe she's still drinking plenty of juice, I wasn't sure, but that's where we're up to with her. Um, so I haven't actually seen her since then, but um, that, that's where we're at with the case. And um, my thought for today to get out of this case is, you know, are there any sort of special conditions or syndromes that we should be looking for? Um, one thing that concerned me was how tall she was as well as how big she was and whether that was something I should be concerned about. Um, and thyroid came up, so is that something we should be really looking for? Um, and are there special ways of excluding those things from the history and examination that we should do with patients when obesity is raised? Um, and is there some basic workup that we should probably do for obese children? Um, and um, are there any special recommendations for childhood obesity as opposed to adult obesity, which a lot of general practitioners may be quite happy to deal with um, adult obesity, but is there something special and different for kids? Um, when should we get our specialists involved? Um, and are there any sort of local programs or things that you're aware of? Okay, <coughs> so put your hands together for Lucy for that presentation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Thank you, okay, so um, Lucy will probably kick off with a couple of questions um, and then we open it up to the audience um, for any discussion points that you, you may want to raise around that. So. 
Okay, so yeah, I was just going to ask, I might start with Shemantia yeah. if that's all right. Yeah. Um, just about, um, are you aware of any special mm -hmm. syndromes that we should be looking for and kind of screening, screening for yeah. in obese children? You mentioned just the height that you were worried about. I'd probably be more worried if the child was short and big. Mm -hmm. um, we often do see children who are reasonably big who are also tall. So mm -hmm. if they're disproportionately short, I think you'd be worried that there might be some kind of growth hormone problem. or um, So you might want to refer on to a specialist then. Mm -hmm. um, I think you did pretty well in terms of initial screening tests and going over um, just some lifestyle modifications and things. A BMI, I think, always needs to be done because you don't really know. They might be big and they might be tall and big, um, but you need to plot what their BMI is doing over a period of time um, and blood pressure as well. Cause, and often that's a way of encouraging parents, I think, just to try and be a bit more proactive in management, um, particularly if they haven't come to you initially for the consult, it's just mm -hmm. been found on the consult. Um, you could mention that if there are problems with the blood pressure, um, adjusted for the height, um, that might be a way in for you. I think doing a thyroid is reasonable, um, and a lot of parents will ask and say, well, it's obviously an underactive thyroid, mm -hmm. and that's a problem. So, um, but I think that's the main thing, that if they look short, if they look dysmorphic, I think if they've got any other learning problems in school um, mm -hmm. or any other difficulties, then you might be looking for more chromosomal-based things or considering referral to a specialist um, for other investigations. At some point, if you, if you felt they were morbidly obese, you'd want to be doing fasting cholesterols and things like that. And again, just looking into the medical aspect and as a way into the parents um, to try and do some modifications. Um, but otherwise, I thought that's a reasonable opening because it's not going to be something that is managed quickly. No. And I think you're going to need to build up a rapport with mm. the family mm. to try and manage it effectively. So. Thank you. Um, so if I can ask Rosen, what did you think of my diet plan? <laughs> I, I thought um, there were definitely some, some good points there. I think if, if I was to see a child, I would take a very thorough diet history and it would be an individual um, that you know, I would give recommendations according to their, their diet history and make changes that would uh, reflect more to the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, yeah. to making sure they're getting enough serves of all of the core foods and not having too many extras. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I think, that, think that you did, did quite well there. Yeah, <laughs> and maybe, I know that you were saying that the mum had said she's very active, but someone's how active, how active how like some some people think oh, I'm very active I walked to the letterbox and back mm. you know more quantifying it and and mm. seeing what that actually was and on that yeah. point as well just in terms of the diet and oh it's very healthy yes. actually getting them to do a food diary so you can see what quantities they're having because yes. often they might be having a healthy diet but if they're having huge quantities at every serving that's still going to cause them problems. Um, but getting an idea of what they think is a healthy diet. Some people do think that having some frozen chicken nuggets, frozen potato gems and some peas is a reasonably well-balanced diet because they think they've got potatoes and vegetables and a bit of meat in there and yeah. that's good. So I think getting an idea of mm. what they think is a healthy diet. Yes. Awesome. Um, if I can ask you what, what you felt, Roz, about um, my um, uh, consultation and how that went, um, if you could offer any pointers. I think you did very well overall. <laughs> I, I'm just wondering, obviously this 10-year-old would have eventually cottoned on to the fact that mum had said something about her weight because you went into quite a lot of detail. How did she react eventually? Um, she was pretty... Um, um, okay with me having a look at her and I think maybe she did figure it out but she was a very polite girl and I don't think she was going to make a fuss um, but I wonder she did seem maybe a little bit withdrawn um, and so I think you know maybe it did um, 
you know, children are always a bit nervous coming to see the doctor. Um, and she was quite happy for me to look at her ankle. And I said, oh, why don't we just get your height and weight and see how you're going? I think she was a bit like, ooh. Um, but, you know, she was cooperative and she um, accepted what I was saying. Um, however, she was seen by another doctor later. So I don't know. Yeah. I think it's an incredibly difficult problem. Um, and it's one that, as Shamanthi and everyone, all, we all agree, is something that takes time and, and, and it's a huge problem. And the major successes I've had of where mum is a little bit overweight herself and actually goes on, we never call it a diet, that's not a good thing, but goes on to an eating regime mm. similar to the daughter. And that's when I've had success involving a dietitian mm. who also you know, can do some of the um, good work. And, and it's amazing to me what people do think is a healthy diet mm. and what you and I would think was a terribly unhealthy diet. Thank you. Um, I was also going to ask, sorry, just about um, with um, Katie. She did, um, her mother did bring up that she was quite sensitive to it and was being bullied at school um, as part of that. Um, and if, maybe if you could talk a bit about that and how we might approach um, sensitive issues with patients like that, particularly when we know that there's a bit of harassment going on in other areas, such as at school. Because everyone said, yeah, it's really quite a complex case. Obesity, childhood obesity in particular, is not just about the child, it's about the whole family. So despite the fact that mum was sticks in, we don't even know that there's a history of obesity there, whether she's got problems with eating. I've seen a number of parents bring their children in and they are sticks in and they were often overweight as a child mm. but they don't really want to talk about it so they really adopt quite restrictive practices in their eating so it's quite interesting to me when mum says oh don't talk to her about that she's a little bit sensitive so I really wonder if there's some behavioural issues going on at home so she might be quite polite with you mm. but I've seen very polite children <laughs> be really quite um, I don't know outrageous at home I would say well, has it to say. Mm. And in terms of establishing rapport, kids are really quite smart at that age, mm. has been my experience. So then I tend to look for things like, are they socially withdrawn? You know, what do they like at sport? They're really active, so what do you really like? You know, I'd be looking for symptoms of anxiety, looking for things like, you know, do you feel confident in being able to, you know, eat that sort of a, you know, portion size? Well, what does that mean? What do you eat? Because as my colleagues have said, honestly, some of the food, they'll say, my children have a really healthy diet and they have seven apples, three oranges, five bananas, you know, it just keeps going on and on and on. So it's really quite complex and, you know, just being really mindful that children will often take, you know, quite a bit of time to talk about these sorts of matters. So I'd be looking at some of the uh, correlates that we know are associated with obesity, such as depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, interpersonal problems, at school, you know, what's happening in the family, but that's not going to be in one or two sessions, obviously. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Rose, I was just wondering, um, with the guidelines that Lucy put up, which I think were from the RACGP with that ask and, and that sort of thing, then often with registrars, when we get kids into practice who are obviously obese, it is a very difficult thing to ask, and sometimes you'll look for any other issue or any other uh, other thing like, like Lucy was saying that maybe this is just a, a health check or something like that so um, are there particular ways that you do address this problem or that you know that you can give um, any suggestions to registrars how to address that and, and maybe Sandra too in a, in, a, in, a, in a psychologically appropriate <laughs> kind of way as well yeah. I guess. I um, tend to uh, get to know the child first maybe over a couple of sessions rather than just heading straight into um, now look, we're a bit worried about your weight. Um, I do actually try very hard to weigh and measure all the children that come. We have a nurse that we try to do that every three months so that we do get a pattern of what's happening. Um, but it's just still very difficult. But what I try to do before I get to the really hard stuff is try to get to know the child. And as you say, talk about what how they exercise and find out whether they're happy because there often is anxiety 
um, and depression and other things going on as well. So I basically tried to get to know the child before I really hit them with blood tests or discuss portion sizes or and and I eventually get the mother in fact to say look we as a family are all a little bit worried about your weight you know I, I don't just think it should be left up to us to be the hard ones I think the parents have to be involved as well any more questions perhaps from the floor or Hello, I'm Stephen Smith. I'm a GP registrar in the country. Um, I was just wondering if any of you have any ideas on um, just why obesity has become so prevalent in recent years in our society, particularly among children and adults. And uh, is it uh, a fundamental shift in our culture or do we have different values now than what we had, say, 50 years ago? Or, or would, say, uh, my... <laughs> grandparents had uh, such high obesity rates in their um, society if they had such access to highly processed carbohydrates and fatty foods or it, it seems like a paradox to me that in our culture we never sort of have worshipped the the body beautiful and the supermodels more than we do now and yet our obesity rates are skyrocketing why, why is that and if, uh, I think one of the first things is if my generation compare what we did to the younger generation, we were free to be able to walk. I mean, we walked everywhere. It was perfectly safe. So we walked to and from school. We walked to the shops. We, we did a lot of, you know, uh, exercise that we didn't even realise we were doing. So I think that's really important. I think, you know, we had 50 years ago, we had a parent who was usually at home who you know cooked for us spent all day cooking and was very selective about what we ate unlike today where you often have families where both parents work and convenience food is a lot better um it that that's the two things that really hit me about the changes yeah i think um <clears throat> i think a lot more indoor activities not walking around, not, not going out on bikes. I spent most of my childhood riding around on a bike all over the countryside. And I think nowadays kids do do that, but they're also there playing their Wii and their you know, and computer games. And um, But I think convenience foods is a really big thing because people think, well, that sounds OK, that sounds pretty healthy, we'll get that, shove that in the oven and we'll eat that. But it's eaten very quickly. It might be eaten in front of the TV. It might be grabbed on your way out to drop a, a child off somewhere else. So you sort of eat very quickly. Don't really have time to digest. Don't make it a social occasion. And then you might feel, oh, we're a little bit hungry on the way home. We'll just grab another quick snack. And it's it's just whole lifestyle changes, busy lifestyles, doing lots of things, lots of readily available pre-packaged food that can be quite high in fat in fatted sugar. And Another thing as well is that our portion sizes have mm. really grown. Yeah. Like the, our plates are bigger than what they used to be and things like that would have been special treats we now have every day like cakes and muffins and things like that and their sizes are a lot bigger as well. So I think that's another another aspect of it as well. Yeah, and I really think that children, many children, are often left to their own devices, and so when they're playing all these games and getting all this quick fix, so Definitely. it's really easy to, you know, mm -hmm. pop the food, and so then also they're using avoidant coping. So every time I feel stressed, what I'm going to do is I'm going to eat instead, and so they. You know, often when I see kids, it's difficult for them to articulate what they're feeling because they don't spend as much time with their parents as the panel has said here. And it's really quite problematic for them. So even to articulate their feelings, they're interacting so much with the computers and so forth. And the various technologies that they've now got for the kids is just really quite incredible. So in, time, in terms of sport, it's very rare that I would see a child who's really actively engaged in sport who's really obese. 
once you start putting together diaries and journals and, you know, really start to objectify what is it that we're looking at here. You know, they might go riding a bike or running once a week and they're really active. So it's really looking at how the parents and the child conceptualise food and activity and how much time they're spending at home in front of the computers or their games. And I think also it's, it starts from a very young age and I've seen quite a few parents bring in their babies who are not having as much a formula as the tin sets. So that's a problem for them, that they're not having the specified volume that the tin says they should be having. And, oh, you know, what should we do about that? And the baby's growing perfectly well on the growth chart and is a nice chubby baby. But the parents see that that's a problem, that they're not eating what they should do. Mm. Um, and just, I think everyone loves chubby babies. I know, if your baby's chubby, that's great. They look lovely. If they're a little bit thin, they're like breastfed babies usually are. Oh, aren't they tiny? Oh, aren't they cute? Oh, what's wrong with them? And although we love supermodels and actors and actresses and they look great, they're also, you see lots of images, they get fat, they then go on this super diet, lose a whole heap of weight, and they're all nice and thin again. So a whole diet culture has crept in that, well, we can go on this crash, you know, this great diet, lose all this weight, mm. and then carry on eating what we want to eat. Mm. Can I say I've experienced a bit of um, food is love coming from, from mm. patients' uh, messages, um, and one of them was a baby that um, mum's like, I don't know if she's getting enough, and the baby was clearly overweight, um, and she's feeding this baby, nearly two years old, um, bottles and bottles and bottles and bottles of formula as well as solid food um, and I don't think she's getting enough food and she's getting more than enough food mm. um, but it's because they love their babies so much mm. they want to feed them um, and the same with um, you know, grandparents saying eat everything on your plate mm. we've cooked you this special meal mm. you must eat it all even if you're not hungry because um, you know I made this food for you because I love you um, and so you know children don't want to say no because it's a rejection of that love mm. um, and then it's sort of force feeding in a way, um, which may, may be another thing that comes in for some people. Yeah, and I had um, went to a talk recently um, based on the Nourish program, which is something that it's a, it's a trial that's going on of looking at childhood eating habits and how to change children's behaviour in regards to eating. And one of the things they said was this concept of finish everything on your plate, mm. because it was encouraging children to eat everything and become overweight. One of the things was not to encourage them to do that, mm. um, within limits, obviously, but um, that shouldn't be a, you have to eat everything in your plate and then you will get this treat afterwards. Mm. Well, that brings... Okay, another question, if that uh, With the uh, obesity rates getting so high amongst children, we have mentioned that there is a a social stigma around it. Um, do you think that will be become less and less? Of, if 25% of kids are overweight, gee, that's uh, it's getting to the stage where being um, having a normal BMI, you're almost the odd kid out, and you wouldn't be called uh, fatty and chubby boomsticks anymore if half of the class is fat. You know, it's um, or is it still got the? Because I was a chubby child myself, so I I, I can relate to it. Um, is there still, do you think, the very much the social stigma? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, kid, Absolutely. Kids are really teased, and I'm quite surprised from a very early age now about the weight, probably from about grade one in school. Mm. And it causes a lot of distress. Can I, can I comment on the school where this particular patient came from? There's apparently a culture that I've heard from this patient and other patients um, that it's uncool to eat lunch. So nobody brings a packed lunch to school, nobody eats at school, but they go home and they pig out. <laughs> yeah, so that's a, a very um, um, you know, a health averse culture at the school. And obviously th there is some systemic bullying there about weight. And I've seen it actually come from some other children about um, they get picked on for all kinds of things, but one of them is, is about food and eating at lunchtime. So I've, well, I've certainly seen that a lot. So there hasn't been one child that I've seen that's been obese, that hasn't been teased. They all come for that reason. 
and it's really quite sad for them because then they tend to do exactly what Lucy was saying, they don't eat and then they're, they're binging later. Okay, so we're getting close. We'll have a couple more questions from the audience. We've got Jim McConaughey here, GP in town. Yeah, um, I've got a uh, couple of questions. Um, I, Kay just pointed out the NHMRC guidelines are over 200 pages. Uh, yeah. Usually the bigger the problem and the less the answers, the more yeah, yeah. written There's stuff no about them. them. Um, I, I've got one question. I mean, I sometimes use waist circumference in adults to, to scare the hell out of them. I say to a man, your waist is 105 centimetres and once it's over 104, your, your risk of diabetes and the need for needles is high. Do you have figures like that for children? Um, is one question. And the second one I just, to the, that's to you as a paediatrician. And the, the second point I have is, um, to the panel in general is, we're now, um, we're now punishing smokers for smoking in cars and putting their children at risk. We, uh, we penalise people who don't immunise their children with Centrelink. Is there, a, is there a, a social responsibility to, to have some sort of community response rather than just individual medical responses to this obesity problem? So to do with the um, waste measurement, there are in those um, national, I always forget the title, in those guidelines and in the NICE guidelines from the UK, they do mention that you can do um, a waist circumference and if the waist to height ratio is over 0.5, then that's worrying. So there's no set tables. But they do also stress that there isn't enough data on that. So the NICE guidelines currently don't recommend that that is done routinely. Um, it's more to go on the BMI, and if that's over, I think, 95%, 95%, 95th percentile, yeah, um, as a trend. Um, but, yeah, so you certainly can do the waist circumference, but at the moment, because we don't have specific guidelines as to um, or specific data on how that fits in, um, it's not really used much at the moment. But I think if you've got an apple-shaped kid, that's another, yeah, that's something else you can sort of use to try and motivate the family. And it can also be used in the other way, whenever people are starting to lose weight, that can be a really good indicator of the weight loss, not just what's happening on the scales. Mm. So it, it can be useful in, in measurements. Just, um, we've got a, a question actually from Dan Halliday um, who's, who's watching this remotely um, and Dan uh, asked the question, is there a role do you think for GPs in uh, uh, schools, to, to go into schools to, to try and address the, the problem actually within, within schools? Have you heard of this happening before? Do you, do you know Shamanthi or? School fat camps. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, um, I think you certainly I'm not sure what benefit you'd get from that because I really think that you need to target the whole family uh, you know, because it's not, it's usually not just the child, it'll be um, ideas that they've picked up from their parents in terms of eating and exercise and, um, and how their life revolves around food. So I think just targeting the schools is probably not going to do much. I think trying to... W one thing I always find interesting in Australian schools is that there's no set meal program. Like, so I come from England, we always have a set lunchtime meal, which is starting to get a bit more healthier. With be It's 31% the obesity problem in England. Um, and they tend to getting healthier foods there, more sort of salad based things and that's very hard to achieve in Australian schools because we don't have that but maybe encouraging more exercise having um, and they're recommending at least 60 minutes of exercise per day for a child which sounds a lot but then you think most children should be actually running around and so it's probably not that much um, but having more set periods of PE or sort of um, weight directed exercise as opposed to just running aimlessly around some field or gathering in a corner and getting away with not doing much at all. Mm. 
would probably be more beneficial. But I don't know if anyone else feels that GPs in schools would be useful. I think you're right, Shamanthi. I think it's it, it's a, usually a whole family pro, uh, problem. Um, so I don't think we could be all that beneficial in that area. I think talking about healthy diets to young kids can be beneficial because they do pick up on a lot of things and go home and go, oh, this is how, many, how much vegetables I should be eating. But whether it's a GP or someone yes. into the schools anyway and healthy education. Yeah. So we've got Cathy James, who's a GP here in town, who'd like to ask one more question. I think we're probably going to have to wrap it up with this question, however. So we'll, we'll take this last one from Cathy. Oh, thank you. Um, I noticed in the case that you presented, um, the child was being bullied and probably had low self-esteem. And I've noticed, um, you know, sometimes when families come in, they tend to, um, even if other members in the family are overweight, they often present with the problem child. And um, I just wondered how you actually, w what you said to families about how you, how you prevent them kind of saying, this child is the problem. You know, what do you actually say to them to kind of shift that away from, you know, what Chamanthi was talking about is actually a family problem, but how do you actually affect that change? Myself, I don't think I did that all that well in that case uh, because I was looking at her specifically and I was trying to see her ankle as well as see how big she actually was. Is this a problem for her? Um, so it was very much patient focused, that particular consultation. Um, however, um, you know, I, I know that it is important, um, particularly in behavioural issues, which is going to come up next, to, to um, emphasise that the whole of family is important and the same with, with obesity and, and looking at what are the family's um, ways of, of doing things, like do they eat at a table together or do they just eat individually and those things. In my experience with other sort of issues as well, sort of addressing the parent and sort of um, even just suggesting that they might be part of the problem is sometimes quite often met with some resistance mm. that, you know, what are you going to do to fix my child mm. <laughs> is, is a big um, problem to come up against. And it's always just about using language to try and guide them back to the idea of actually you need to take responsibility for your child as well and why these things are happening to your child is not just their fault. <laughs> Sometimes some well-directed questions, and I do this a lot with the behavioural mm. children, is just asking about the background, the setup, and and sometimes they come to the realisation that, oh, actually, you know, this is going on and that's probably contributing, so mm. that sometimes helps. Okay, so um, unfortunately we're going to have to leave it there. We're, um, we're going to run out of time, so... Um, I'd like to thank Lucy for her brilliant case presentation tonight and also for the expert panel on their feedback and the questions from the audience and um, from those uh, streaming remotely. So if you put your hands together and thank <laughs> tonight.